EW is not an add-on in conflict. It's not an optional extra. It's not a thing that's nice to have. It is as integral to the outcome of any military action, be that a small tactical action or be that a whole war, as force weight, as tactical acumen, as battle rhythm, as generalship, as leadership, as all of these other factors are, it is as important. This was part of a conversation I had with Dr. Thomas Whittington, an expert in electronic warfare, or EW as it is known, about the role of electronic warfare on modern battlefields. As you can see from this totally unstaged footage, I stepped away from the conversation with a newfound appreciation of how reliant and vulnerable we are on and to electronic warfare, especially as countries like Russia and China keep stepping up their game. Yes, also Russia. I know the meme is right now that they can't do anything, but they are very active in the electronic warfare domain and have been for a very long time. Regarding the role of EW in the Russian-Ukrainian war, there's a video coming out soon and it will be available to patrons and channel members before everyone else, but you can already check out all the conversations I had with Thomas over on Patreon. In this video, I want to address the meta questions, which are, what is electronic warfare? Why is it significant? And how do we make it tangible? I know, everybody kind of knows what EW is, but as with everything, once we lift that veil of ignorance-inspired confidence, we discover that we haven't even scratched the surface. So, welcome back to Military Aviation History. My name is Chris. This video is sponsored by the United States Naval Institute of Press. Let's get into it. What is electronic warfare? Simply put, electronic warfare is a military action that involves the use of electromagnetic and direct energy to control or affect the electromagnetic spectrum or to attack the enemy. These electromagnetic operations, EMOs, take place in what is called the electromagnetic environment, EME. The means of executing this are diverse. They include, of course, the detection of enemy signals, the listening into of enemy signals, the deception or spoofing of enemy signals, or the outright jamming of, yes, enemy signals. EW is often related to other types of warfare, but we shouldn't get confused. Take for example cyber warfare, that also fulfills similar role. But to put it simply, to achieve its result, EW uses directed energy against or between systems. Cyber warfare instead infiltrates systems. So while the effect might be similar, the means are completely different. The United States differentiate between three forms of electronic warfare and similar definitions exist at NATO level. Electronic support, electronic protection, electronic attack. Now, Electronic warfare support relies on signal intelligence, SIGINT, which is composed out of electronic intelligence, ELINT, and communications intelligence, COMINT. These are primarily concerned with probing and gaining information on enemy threats, capabilities, and locations, as well as intentions, command, and structure. Electronic protection involves limiting or masking the electromagnetic signature or footprint of systems and hardening these systems to reduce the effect of enemy EW operations. And then we have electronic attack, which is what we commonly think of as EW, though really it is only a subset thereof. Electronic attack primarily involves the jamming and deceiving of enemy radar, communication and data links. It can also be linked to actions that limit the effectiveness of enemy systems or their outright destruction, for example via aircraft firing specialized missiles that hone in on radar signatures to destroy the radar set. But it is important to remember that electronic attack in its definitional form is all about using directed energy and not missiles. Why is electronic warfare so significant? Simply put, electronic warfare plays a key part in the operation and survival of a military force. Consider this, throughout history, lines of communication, well, first of all, observation points, and then lines of communications were vital for warfare on the strategic level within large empires, during operational maneuvers of armies that went towards a battleground, and then during the actual battle. You need to collect data. You need to get orders and reports from one place to another. And if that link gets cut or your observation points get destroyed, 
you stagger about in the dark. Since World War I, and in fact even before that, communication has gone electronic, and by extension, digital. What used to be a lookout, a ship, a rider, or a motorcycle, or a set of flags even, is now radar, radio, or satellite. If those links are intercepted or decrypted, one side can listen into the lines of communication of the other. Consider how codebreakers during World War II intercepted, decoded, and listened into German communications and thus drew valuable information from the Axis without the Axis actually knowing this. That was part of electronic warfare. More actively, we can also affect or cut communication by deception or jamming. As a result, a military force starts to lose the ability to identify, report, analyze, track, or share accurate information or disseminate timely orders as a cohesive entity. The result is splintering, paralysis, decisions based on insufficient data, and so on. And this can happen on the strategic, operational, or tactical level. Equally, a lot of our important weapon systems depend on the electromagnetic spectrum, like air defenses. Long-range air defenses, the outer layer of our defensive systems against planes or even intercontinental ballistic missiles, depend on radar surveillance, as well as communication within the integrated air defense systems, the IATs, and once they launch interception missiles, also active radar guidance. If these get jammed, outmaneuvered, suppressed, or deceived, you take away a force's ability to defend itself against air. And if a force loses the air war, there is a good chance it will lose the war in itself or inflict at a very high cost at the minimum, because now every single military asset it has can be attacked, never mind where it is. And that's me just talking about the air domain. On the ground, EW also plays a vital role, but that's outside of my spectrum of interest. There's a whole war that's going on in that domain. And that's a war that includes strong points, it includes relatively undefended areas, it includes um, attack, it includes counterattack, it includes flanking, it includes maneuver in the same way that we'd expect a land force or their maritime and air equivalents to do it. If you are a Patreon or channel supporter, check out the multiple conversations I had with Thomas Whittington that are already uploaded and available to you. And beyond that, as a recommendation for the cold months coming up for either yourself or a friend, I highly encourage you to go with this book, Fighting in the Electromagnetic Spectrum by Thomas Wildenberg. And I just realized those two names are very similar, but yes, it's a different Thomas. This book is an excellent introduction into EW basics and then it takes that and it builds up an understanding of EW by providing historical examples and by looking at the US Navy specifically. It's a great gift to yourself or a fellow aviation nerd. And you know what makes it even greater? Not just that Christmas is coming up and you can get it for then, but my exclusive 25% off discount code at the Naval Institute Press. That's right. Those are savings that are coming in faster than any harm missile fired at a radar dish. Don't just use it on this one book though. It works on all the books in their catalog and yeah, it's valid all year round. I don't think I have to remind you of this. Yeah, hit up my uh, official reading list for more curated recommendations and get to saving 25% by using MillAVHIS on checkout. As we saw, there is a whole host of applications of electronic warfare. So let's talk about a tangible example about how EW affects the air domain. Here we are, we're in our planning cell. How are we going to do this? Let's suppose that our target is an important railway junction that is being used by the enemy to move troops and equipment from one part of the theater of operations to another. So it's an important, it's an operational level target um, that is going to be engaged on a battlefield interdiction mission. So the first thing that we're going to do is try and ascertain what is protecting that target. So in this case, let's say it's being protected by its own dedicated medium medium altitude, medium range surface to air missile system that's radar guided. There's a smaller uh, radar assisted show rad short range air defense unit that's also protecting it. That's a combined surface to air missile and anti-aircraft artillery unit. And it's fairly deep within enemy territory. So it is protected by a larger integrated air defense system that's responsible for protecting the airspace of that territory. And that includes longer range SAM systems and it also includes fighter defenses. So the first thing we'll try and do is plot a route to the target that primarily avoids that radar coverage. 
Um, it might not be, in, in fact, almost certainly will not be the quickest route. The quickest route will be a straight line. It may be dog-legged. We may do many things to not only avoid the radar detection ranges, but also to build up additional capabilities or exploit aspects that give us further protection. This may get us, let's say, three quarters of the way to our objective. But then we've still got these medium range and short range systems immediately near the railway junction that we need to worry about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look up the, intel the intelligence assessment of those radars. We're able to see the frequencies that they transmit on, certain things about their radar transmissions. And what we then do is we ensure that our own defensive systems, so our own jammers on the aircraft. So firstly, we have a radar warning receiver that tells us someone is trying to lock onto us and track us using radar. And then we have a jammer that will attempt to break that radar's lock in some way. So through a jamming signal, through a deception signal. And also, um, we're lucky because today we've got a couple of anti-radar missiles on board. And if all else fails, we can fire those off and uh, they will seek out the hostile radars and uh, destroy them by flying straight into their antennas and detonating. We've also got chaff on board. That's something we can disperse. Uh, should a missile uh, be launched, I mean, this is sort of in the, in the worst case scenario. Ideally, we want to avoid that in the first place. But should this happen, we fire off the chaff. The chaff will hopefully break the radar lock between the uh, missile and us using the missile's radar or the radar that is guiding that missile to us as a target. So they're all the things we're doing ourselves. Now, we're also particularly lucky today because not only have we got the anti-radar missiles on board, but also very usefully, we've got some standoff jamming assistance from our own Air Force. And they're gonna fly up a dedicated aircraft with a heap of jammers on board. They stay just outside the range of the hostile air defenses. Um, but they have a very powerful jamming signal that can reach any radars uh, or indeed radio communications that choose to cause us problems. Now, what they're going to do today is not jam the radars. We want to be as covert as possible. The minute we start jamming the radars or something starts jamming the radars, we're indicating something is up and something's happening. So we said, ideally, if you could pull back on the radar jamming, but what we do need you to do is jam the communications between the uh, various air defense units. That's still going to alert them to the fact that something's going on, but it might not be immediately obvious where the action is happening. I'm simplifying this planning process hugely. It will be much more detailed than what, what I'm describing, but we do all of our prep and EW is a key part of the mission planning. We go and execute our sortie. We're keeping a continuous eye on what is happening in the electromagnetic spectrum while we're going. We're also observing radio silence while we do the mission. Um, we're keeping the aircraft dark, so we're not putting out any radar emissions. We're not putting out any uh, radio emissions from the aircraft. We may need to switch on our radar shortly before we launch the our uh, ordnance to attack that railway junction. But you know that's 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 a risk we're going to have to take. We're going to have to do that very quickly. Initially, I was going to say that in today's world, you know, that growing connectivity and the growing reliance on wireless transfers, radio communication, satellites, and so on, yes, that the role of EW only gets more important. And that's true in a way. But frankly, we are already living in that world. And in a way, we have always lived in that world. Take Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire. They had a dedicated rider system that allowed them to transfer messages from east to west and west to east in what was back then record-breaking speeds. That was their strategic line of communications to receive and send messages and information. And their ability to react as an empire was based on it. Or take the riders bringing messages from generals to commanding officers during battles that contain information such as when to attack, where to attack, how to attack, and so on. Conceptually, there is no difference to intercepting or deceiving or eliminating those lines of communications than that of a nowadays satellite or radio. EW is an extension of what has been done before. Different means, different targets, different magnitude, a simplification, yes. Broadly speaking, however, technology, equipment, procedures, tactics, they constantly change and evolve, but the main capabilities they provide are analogous. 
Warfare is a constant duel between the sword and the shield, measure versus countermeasure. We know the importance, we understand the importance of observation, of information, of lines of communication, of decision making, coordination, the ODA loop, organization, force multipliers, maneuver, employment, and quite frankly, any sort of other buzzword you can think of now, right now, that underlines or underwrites the ability to act as a cohesive military force. And right now, our means of doing so have shifted from the pen and paper to the digital and the electromagnetic. So from the analog to the digital. As such, of course, we need a comprehensive and concerted offensive and defensive effort and capabilities to retain that electromagnetic dominance, because that is what currently sustains our social, political, and military ability to function. Thomas, over to you. Montgomery said in the Second World War that if we lose the battle in the air, we lose the war and we lose it quickly. I think today and in the future, the radio spectrum and the electromagnetic spectrum as a whole is just as relevant. If you do not exert some kind of control within the electromagnetic spectrum and you are able to protect your use of it while trying to frustrate the enemy's use of it, I think you're doomed to be blunt. I don't think uh, you can realistically expect to prevail in uh, any military engagement. Thank you here to patrons and channel members for their support of this channel. Make sure that when you pass via the exit button here, pick up a couple of books with that 25% discount code Christmas is coming up. Get it something for yourself or for a loved one. I also want to thank Andrew and Bernard Kast from Military History Visualized for their fire support on this video. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.